The last Silo theorem is Silo theorem number three. It's pretty powerful, as we'll see in our next example. It says this. Let P1 through PS be all possible Silo P subgroups of G. So write down all possible Silo P subgroups of G. There are S of them. This theorem says that S is congruent to 1 mod P. That means the remainder after S is divided by P is 1. And S divides the size of the group. So this gives you information about the number of possible Silo P subgroups. So here's a proof. Again, we're going to use group actions. I'm going to let X be the set of all these Silo P subgroups. So there's my set X. And I'm going to say that P1 acts on X by conjugation. P1 is the first Silo P subgroup that I wrote down here. And when I mean, when I say P1 acts on X by conjugation, I mean that if you take an element A, so there's an element A in P1, and you take any other set P in X, I define the group action to be A inverse PA. So that's the group action. Now a key observation is that the orbit of P1 under this group action is just the set P1. P1 is the only element in its orbit. What does that mean? Well, this is because if I take any element A in P1 and I operate on the set P1, this by definition of the group action, is A inverse P1A. But P1 is a subgroup. It's a subgroup, so it's closed under multiplication. This is just P1 again. That's true for all A in P1. So that's the same equivalent statement as saying P1 is in its own orbit. Furthermore, no other element in X is in its own, is in an orbit of size 1, is in an orbit of size 1. Why is that? Well, it's a similar reasoning here. Uh, for example, A P2, uh, this is A inverse P2A, this cannot always equal P2. So this is not always P2 for any, for all elements A in P1 because you're taking element A in P1 something in P1 times something in P2 will not always land back in P2 so no other element in the set X is within an orbit of size 1 therefore S that's the size of the set X, is congruent to the size of those elements in X that are fixed by everything in P1. This was our lemma from a few videos ago. So this is a lemma that we proved a couple videos ago. This is working mod P. But the argument here 
says that the only orbit of size 1 is the orbit that contains p1. So this is equal to 1 mod p. That's the first statement here. S is congruent to 1 mod p. Now for the second part, I need to prove that S divides G. I'm still going to keep the same set X, but this time I'm going to act on X by the entire group G. So the entire group G acts on X by conjugation. So I'm not going to just use elements in P1 like I did for this argument here. I'm going to use any element A I'd like. So it's the same kind of idea as before, except I'm enlarging what my values of A could be. In this case, every, every element in X is in the same orbit. This is a result of Silo theorem number two. Silo theorem number two basically says this exact same statement in disguised form. So Silo theorem number two says if you take any two Silo P subgroups, they're conjugate. You can get one Silo P subgroup from another by doing this operation. That means that you could start with P1 and find any other CELO P subgroup you'd like by doing A inverse P1A for some element A in the group. Thus, S, that's the size of X, that's the same as the orbit of P1. And using, once again, the orbit stabilizer theorem, this is the number of left cosets of the stabilizer subgroup G, P1, in G. That's the size of the group G divided by the size of the stabilizer subgroup. So in other words, that's an equivalent statement to saying that S has to divide the size of the group. That's the end of the proof of our third and final Silo theorem.